Hey guys, this is going to be a video that's a little bit different compared to the ones I have been uploading. Um, this one's going to be a comprehensive list of the major mistakes I see people make when they are studying for the MCAT. And so this is coming from someone who scored a 527, and I, uh, I've been helping people with this exam for a while now, and so these are just based on my observations and my personal experience. So thanks for stopping by, and hopefully this guide will help you through this, this journey through the infamous MCAT. Before we begin, I want to give a quick disclaimer. There are probably a hundred different ways to study for this exam, uh, but these recommendations are based on my personal experiences and the observations I've made when I help students who are studying for this exam. So take these recommendations with that in mind um, and see which one exactly fits your studying habits and style the most. All right, so what exactly is the MCAT? The MCAT, officially known as the Medical College Admission Test, is an exam administered by the AAMC. It's the official test you need to take before you uh, apply to medical school. And it's uh, scored on a range between 472 to 528, with a mean every year ranging between 500 to 502. The MCAT has four sections, chemistry and physics with one, CARS, um, which is known as critical analysis and reasoning, as a second section, biology and biochemistry as a third section, and psychology and sociology as the fourth section. I'm assuming most of you guys watching this video already know exactly what the MCAT is, so we'll go ahead and dive in to the, the common mistakes I see when people study for this exam. So what is the first mistake I see students make when they are studying for this exam? And it's going into this study prep with, uh, without an honest assessment of yourself, just going in blind. So what does this exactly mean? The way I see it, there are two components to this exam, and one of the big components is going to be the content. Um, how much knowledge do you have of the actual foundational principles that the MCAT, the scientific foundational principles, that the M MCAT's going to test you on? And so some people, they already have this knowledge. They remember everything. They know everything. Um, now, that's super rare, but there are some people like that. However, if you're not in that category, and if you're like me who fall into levels two or three, you either recently just took the intro courses at your university or maybe some kind of post bac program, um, and that gives you a pretty good idea of what the content is, or maybe you're a few years removed and you don't really quite remember exactly the content that they're going to be asking you on. Um, so just a little disclaimer for if you just took the intro courses, you know, that just ask yourself, hey, I know if you did well in these intro courses, did you do well because you truly understood the material or the course was structured so that you just needed memorized information as opposed to just understanding the, uh, the, the course material as well. So for the MCAT, MCAT purposes, you really do need to understand the course material, um, the intro course materials. So just make sure you're really honest with yourself when you're asking what level you fall into. Now, after you give yourself an honest assessment, where do you go from here? Who most people will start off with these books. So these are subject review books that kind of comprehensively go over all of the knowledge that you need to know or the scientific principles that you need to know for the MCAT. And so the most, most popular brands that I see are Kaplan and the Princeton Review, but there are a lot of other books um, and I'm essentially certain that they, they are almost identical with each other. Okay, so now you have the books. You have to ask yourself, are you gonna skim them? Are you gonna read them? Or are you gonna take notes on them? So skimming is going to be for the people who really, really, really have a strong foundational grasp on all of the content. Um, but I do not re recommend this to anyone, no matter how confident you are. Um, and I recommend that you at the very least read these books um, through. And that's just going to make sure it fills in any gaps in the content that you think you don't have, but that are present. Um, so you can either read them or you can do what I did and take notes on them so you get an even more comprehensive look um, into each of the, the subjects that they're going to be testing you on. So what is the second mistake I see? It's when students make overly ambitious study plans or study plans that they don't even intend on sticking with. So ambitious study plans might look great on paper, but if you can't execute them, they ultimately become useless, right? So you wanna make sure you're actually accurately gauging how much work you can get done every day. Um, some people that might be 20 practice questions, some people might that might be 60, but no one's out here doing 6,000 practice questions a day, right? So again, just make sure you're honestly judging yourself and don't be too ambitious when you're creating your study plan. So how would I go about doing this? First, I will look at the AAMC official website and I will select the date that you want to take your exam. After you select the date, select the date that you're going to start studying for that exam. And so this gives you a time frame of what you need to get done, um, how much time you have um, to get you know, your work done. So set uh, a study plan based on that, things that you need to get done each day. And when you do this, make sure you include days where you know that you'll need break or um, days that account for maybe when emergencies happen. So once you make this study plan, try to stick with it as much as you can. 
Now, life happens. You know, maybe you'll get sick or just things get in the way or maybe you're just not in the right headspace to take this exam or study for this exam. And that's okay. Um, the best thing you can do for yourself right now, if that ever happens, is to not freak out. And obviously, this is easier said than done, but you kind of have to imagine yourself as this water droplet here, um, trying to just adapt and mold into the environment that you're given. So there's nothing you can do now. Um, there's only ways that you can adapt. And I think there are two different ways that you can go about adapting to the situation. And you can either push back your exam date. Um, so maybe you need to delay your exam date by two, two, three weeks. And so go on the AMC website, see if you can do that, and push back your exam date two, three weeks. Or on the other hand, you can condense your studying. So maybe you were doing 30 practice questions a day, um, but now it turns out you have to do 40. Um, or maybe you have to do more flashcards every day. So just make sure you're being realistic if you're condensing your studying. Try not to cut any corners. Don't just take out all the practice questions just because you don't have the time for them. Um, don't cut any corners. Be realistic. Guys, again, no one is doing 6,000 or 1,000 practice, qu uh, practice questions every day. Be realistic with your capabilities and see if condensing your study plan is a feasible option um, if you are really intent on taking your exam on the original date that you set. The third mistake I see is when students think that they can skip the content or think that the content will come with practice. Here's why I think that's wrong. The way I see it, there are two halves to the MCAT. The first half is the content, and the second half is applying the content. Um, so, to give you an analogy, let's say you're trying to learn how to play golf and you've never played, seen golf, never heard of it, right? Well, if you know you have to hit the ball, then you need to ask someone or see how you're going to swing the club to hit the ball. You might need to read a manual or have someone show you, but the baseline is you'll have to learn how to swing the club. The second half would now be going out onto the field um, and practicing that swing, refining that swing. But if you don't even know how to swing or what the swing is in the first place, no matter how much you practice or refine it, you might be working on the wrong swing to begin with. Um, so that way I see it, you really need to make sure you know the content before you practice applying the content to these practice questions. So here's my first controversial take, and it's that you can't skip content at all especially if you're aiming in the 515 plus or the 520 ranges. Here's why I think you can't skip the content especially. On exam day, they're going to see how well can you apply the knowledge that you already have into novel questions or novel um, situations. Well, if you go and practice these questions without any content knowledge or any other content foundations that you need to know, you're not really practicing applying any content. And yes, you'll learn the content once you get these questions wrong or you know, in the rare cases, you get them right but you're not actually practicing applying the content since you didn't have the, the content knowledge beforehand in the first place. And so the way I see it, you're wasting the limited number of these valuable practice questions by practicing a skill that isn't going to be tested on. And that skill is just going in blind and hoping that you can get the question right. So if you want to practice the actual skill that they're going to be testing you on, that skill is going to be how well can you apply the content that you already know onto these, these new questions. So here's my second controversial take, and it's that the best way to learn content, which in my opinion is probably one of the only ways to do well on the exam, um, is through Anki or some kind of related flashcard system. So it doesn't have to be Anki. I know there's a lot of flashcard softwares out there, but some kind of flashcard that has some built-in spaced repetition program in there where you can repeatedly quiz yourself on this type of content. So the MCAT is a completely different exam compared to the ones that most of us are used to. And the reason is you have to memorize this content for months on end. So something you memorize now, this is going to be something that might pop up on your exam three, four, five, six months down the line. And the best way to hold on to that information for four, five, six months down the line is to use this spaced repetition program that continuously quizzes you on whether or not you remember that content. And the best program for me, at least, was Anki. So I might make another video on how I used Anki. Um, so if you guys would like to see that, just let me know. The, one of the big points through Anki is that you have to make sure you do these flashcards every day. Um, try not to skip any days or else it will kind of defeat the purpose of Anki to begin with. You can also make your own Anki flashcards, but I don't recommend that as that takes a lot of time. And you would be better off, in my opinion, just using a pre-made set such as Jack Sparrow or Mile Down. Miles Down or Mile Down. Again, I'll make another video on Anki if you guys would like, and that will go more in-depth about how I think is the best way to use Anki and which decks I think people use um, very often. The fourth mistake I see is when students skip practice questions. This isn't really a full mistake, as in I don't really see any students skipping all practice questions or not doing practice questions entirely. The point I want to make here is there is a gold standard um, 
that's kind of commonly known uh, in this MCAT community, and it's that the AAMC's official practice material, that's going to be the best kind of practice material since it is made by the same company who administers the test. Now, on top of that, UWorld, these, pra these practice questions um, are very, very high quality. They're sometimes seen as on par as the AAMC's um, official practice questions. So I personally, I use just those two sets of practice questions. Um, just make sure that whatever practice questions you're using, I recommend at least doing the official AAMC's official practice questions if you had to only choose one. Mistake 4.5 that I see is when students take the free scored practice exam administered by the AAMC first. The free scored practice exam is commonly referred to as full length five, and this was the exam that was released by AAMC most recently. So what that means is this exam is going to be the most representative of the exam that you're going to see when you actually take the real exam on your exam date. So I always recommend to students that they take this one last to see exactly where they are um, a week or two before their actual exam date. But again, this is more of a pref personal preference, and this is just my personal recommendations that you take this one last. The fifth mistake I see is when students neglect CARS. Um, some students like to think that CARS is a section that can't be improved, and although it is very difficult, at least in my opinion, to improve in CARS, it is still possible as long as you have consistent practice and a very thorough review of all of your practice questions. I would recommend that while you're studying for this, you find a method of analyzing or going through these CARS passages that works for you best and sticking with that one method and really honing in and refining that method as opposed to changing your method a bunch of times. For CARS, you can't really study content, obviously, so this is a this is the one section that I recommend that people start practicing for as soon as they start studying for this exam. It is tough, but just trust me, it will get better as long as you consistently practice. The sixth mistake I see is when students don't take reviewing seriously. They might think they're taking it seriously, but it might not be serious enough. So what does serious review look like? When you do practice questions or practice exams, you have to go back and look at every single question and make sure that you understand why the correct answer was correct and the incorrect answer was incorrect. And if there was a term in one of the answer choices that you didn't know before or you were unfamiliar with, that is the perfect chance for you to make a flashcard. This ensures that the next time you see this term or content or concept, you know what it means, and that increases your likelihood of getting that question correct. Now, for you guys who are really aiming to score above a 520, you have to keep in mind that there is no such thing as low yield. You have to review with that in mind. Essentially, treat every single question as if this would be a question that would come out on your actual exam, and think of all the content and concepts and terms as quote-unquote high yield. So when you're reviewing these practice questions or practice exams, you have to review with that in mind and treat every term, content, or concept as a high yield piece of information that you might see on your actual exam date. And on exam date, when you're trying to score above a 520, the number of questions you can get wrong is very, very small. So to maximize your chances of scoring above a 520, you want to make sure that any question you get wrong isn't due to the fact that you didn't review properly beforehand. For example, let's say you're doing a practice question and you get it wrong because there was a piece of content that you didn't know. And let's say you brush it off and tell yourself that it was a low yield piece of information. On exam day, if you're trying to score above 520 and you see that question, you're for sure probably going to get it wrong again. And that's going to really hurt your chances at scoring above a 520. So again, just keep in mind, there is no such thing as low yield. And if you review with that in mind, it will really maximize your chances of scoring above a 520. The seventh mistake I see is when students don't take practice exams seriously. So what does that mean? These practice exams have to be underdone under testing conditions. So for example, if your test is going to be administered at 8 a.m. and you have a one-hour commute on exam day, well, that means you have to wake up before 7 a.m. every time you take practice exams, at least for the month leading up to your final exam date. Why? Your body needs to get used to waking up that early. Your brain needs to get used to working that hard early in the morning. If you're waking up at 12 p.m. and doing these practice exams at 4 p.m., every day, I think that will hurt your chances as your body won't be used to thinking so hard at 8 in the morning when you're normally asleep. One of the biggest mistakes I see is when students use their phones during the exams. Definitely, definitely no phones. I mean, shut the entire phone off, keep it away, put it in a cabinet for the seven hours that you're doing this practice exam. Do not touch it because you won't be able to touch it on exam day. Even if it's just to check texts or anything like that, again, no phones. You really need to try to emulate the actual examining testing conditions as much as you can. Remember, there are limited breaks 
So there's, I believe it's 10 minute breaks between each section except for the lunch break between the second and third section, which I believe is 30 minutes instead. So do your breaks with this in mind. Don't go over. And on exam date, these breaks will actually be just a little bit shorter because you need to account for the fact that going back into your testing room takes a little bit of time as they do a security check on you. And finally, lunches. So this is kind of a personal thing for me. Um, this is something I just thought I would recommend. And it's that you should choose a lunch that you know won't upset your stomach, won't make you too drowsy, and you should stick with this lunch every time you do practice exams. So let's say it's a ham and cheese sandwich, then stick with a ham and cheese sandwich every time you do a practice exam. So that on exam day, you're eating a ham and cheese sandwich and you're not surprised by anything. You know it won't upset your stomach. You know it won't affect your performance in the next section after your lunch break ends. Again, on exam day, there'll be a time limit on lunch, which means when you're doing your practice exams, you really wanna make sure you're limiting your lunch time to 30 minutes or less as well. Obviously, that means you don't have a lot of time to cook and you definitely won't be able to cook during the actual exam day. So I would just pack a lunch like a ham and cheese sandwich, have it just prepared so that you're used to eating a prepared lunch within a certain time frame and going right back into the exam. A final few words from a stranger on the internet, and I know this will be easier to listen to than to actually believe, but the MCAT does not define who you are, it does not define your identity, and it doesn't define the quality of position that you'll turn out to be. It's not the end of the world, and it's not the end of your career if you don't do as well as you had hoped. There's always retakes available, and at the worst, absolute worst, worst, worst case scenario, you'll have to retake this exam. And that's it. The world's not going to end. The career's not going to end. And again, it doesn't define who you are. The mistakes I have talked about in this video are what I believe are mistakes, but that doesn't necessarily mean everyone thinks those are mistakes. The recommendations I make and the tips that I give are not rated E for everyone. They are based on personal experience and they are based on the observations I have made when working with students who are studying for this MCAT. There are hundreds of ways to study for this exam and some of those ways might include the mistakes that I've talked about in this video. That doesn't necessarily mean that way is incorrect. The correct way is to find the way that works for you. Find what works for you, what study plan works for you, what kind of studying works for you that will really maximize your scores. These recommendations are so that you proceed to other approaches with a little bit of caution just because I don't think they're the best, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they won't be the best for you. So keeping that in mind, Good luck with the MCAT guys. It's a tough exam, but I believe in all of you and good luck to you future physicians. Thanks for watching till the end guys. If you guys wanna see explanations on practice exams or practice questions, my Anki guide, the study schedule I used and the resources I used to score 527 on the MCAT, please subscribe. If you guys have any questions, you can leave them in the comments or you can reach out to me through my email, which is in my channel description. Thanks.